Hello and welcome to the first seminar on renewable energies or better to say the physical foundations of renewable energies. My name is Martin Bayer and I'm currently in my first semester on the Master of Science of Physics and I'm here to present the solutions of the exercises I prepared for you and yeah I'll give my best to explain all of these exercises in a good way uh, hopefully you can all understand me and yeah so let's start uh, the first task was energy forms so we were we were about to give a definition of the primary energy then describe secondary energy and motivate the introduction of the prime energy factor okay let's start first with primary energy so task one energy forms and as you already learned in the lecture there are primary energies and we say that primary energies are the energy form that we find in nature. So um, we write exactly that. So we say it's the energy um, form found in nature. What does this mean? Um, actually, there's no human interaction, so no human uh, engineering or conversion of energy, just raw material that we get from the nature. Um, so this means um, uh, the energy um, contained in raw fuels so what are raw fuels um it's essentially it's just the coal we find underground or natural gas uh, or uranium that we can use for our nuclear power plants and these are all types of primary energy. There are also some renewable energy sources. Um, so renewables. So that are the things of nature itself, like the sun or better sunlight, water and wind. Then we get to secondary energy. Um, so, I don't know. Ah, wrong thing. Okay, so secondary energy. That are all the kind of energy forms that are already processed in, in a certain way. So, for example, the industry refines these energies so mostly they are primary energies primary energy um, refined by the industry so let me give an example. Um, one type of primary energy would, for example, be wood. And if we, um, if the industry makes charcoal, for example, then the charcoal, it's a kind of secondary energy. Um, we often use this secondary energy uh, for easier transportation. So often used 
for easier transportation. For example, it's much easier to transport the charcoal than the wood because it's much denser in a way or a higher, it contains a higher energy density. Um, so as I already said, some examples. We, are, we have wood is not really a secondary energy, but or it's it's kind of the thing we get from nature. But the charcoal, for example, is a form of secondary energy. And for example, when we refine oil, the petrol or the diesel we get is the form of secondary energy. Another example would be district heating. So as you may already know, like in Vienna also, these pipelines, um, they uh, distribute the heat and that's some form of energy transportation and this is also some form of secondary energy. And I want to add a point that only the secondary or the end energy is really a quantity that we can measure. Um, or yes, and therefore uh, we need to find the connection between the primary energy uh, consumption and the uh, price we pay for our energy, for our electric, for el our electricity or anything. So therefore we introduce the so-called primary energy factor. And you were about to discuss this factor. And essentially the prime energy factor is just the ratio of the used primary energy energy over the uh, consumed final energy. And you may already heard some examples in the lecture. Um, some call it FP. It is for electricity, it's 2.7. Uh, for natural gas, it's 1.1, as far as I know. And for wood, it's actually less than 1. It's 2.0, uh, it's 0.2. Uh, and yes, so the primary energy factor it's used to compare different forms of energy and we are looking at the aspect of the environmental impact of those energy forms and this is a measure to compare them used to compare different forms of energy or energy forms And it's weighed in such a way that the uh, prime that we are mainly accounting non-renewable parts of the energy, and they have a much higher factor. For example, electricity is mostly produced by burning coal in power plants. In Germany, it's more than forty percent of the whole share of the energy production, and this is very ineffective because electricity itself, when we are using it for heating, for example, it's very inefficient. So we are losing a lot of primary energy uh, in the actual end energy or the final energy. And therefore it has a very high primary energy factor. So let me write that down. So it's weighed in such a way Uh, that is 
especially uh, non-sustainable or non-renewable non-sustainable Um, energies uh, or energy energy sources better to say energy sources uh, contribute more Contribute, there's an E on the end, contribute more uh, to the energy consumption. So and then we had to say whether or not the uh, primary energy of less than one is actually useful or actually makes sense so a primary energy factor of less than one uh, indeed makes sense because uh, the primary energy factor we just consider the primary energy from non-renewable parts so um, it makes sense if the prime energy only accounts for non-renewable. non-renewable parts so um, even wood even if wood is a renewable source of energy it is it's better to uh, just let the wood stay in the nature because it contains the co2 in the form of wood or in the form of carbon and therefore we release some co2 by burning the wood and therefore the primary energy factor is not zero. Um, this, but for renewable energies like solar cells or uh, wind mills or anything, they are the primary energy is uh, in fact zero. Okay, so for the renewable energies, I want to point out. Renewable energy uh, cannot be uh, consumed in a way. So there is no really way that we, uh, by absorbing all the sunlight, the sunlight disappears or anything like that. We have an infinite supply of sunlight or an infinite supply of wind we could use to uh, produce energy. So that is all I wanted to say about the first task. Now let's move on to the second task where we have to talk about waste of energy. And here we were about to talk about, uh, say something about the causes of high primary energy demands of country and we were to answer the question whether or not is it is fair to compare the environmental impacts of the countries solely via this quantity and so let's write down I just say second waste of energy So just underline it and 
So let's talk about some causes of high energy demand. And there are several of them. So first, um, it really does make a difference whether or not a country is an industrialized country, uh, because a lot of industry, of course, needs a lot of energy and therefore the energy consumption per capita is very high. Um, and with a high industrialized country, there comes along a high standard of living and therefore people demand more resources and therefore more energy. And so to say a high energy demand is caused by a high um, or highly industrialized or highly developed economies. lobbed economies and as already economies and as already said uh, a high standard of living and and I wanted to point out the industries uh, again, for example, if we are having in a country some industries that demand very much en energy, very, very intense uh, energy intensive, and uh, there are also a very high energy demand on the whole country. And so energy intensive industries. For example, oil refinement, also oil refining is a very lot of energy consumes uh, the processing of the oil into petrol or diesel. And other thing is, for example, ore smelting, especially aluminum. aluminum smelting which is very uh, ineffective uh, I should say uh, to extract the aluminum and there are many steps involved and this whole process needs a lot of energy um, another important factor we should consider is uh, the amount of export a country does for example like oil nations of the OPEC or the organization of the petrol exporting countries, I think uh, like Kuwait or Qatar, they are exporting very much oil and therefore their energy demand is also very high. So um, many exports are another cause of a high energy demand. But we also should point out some geographical issues. So if we are in a country which where it is very cold, then we need to heat our houses very much. And this actually may cause very high energy demands, for example, in Canada or so. And Heating is actually very energy intensive, as you might already know or heard in the lecture that almost three quarters of the primary energy consumption are uh, used for heating. So example, cold weather, as I already talked about. Another aspect would be expensive transportation, for example. Um, countries that are on an island or so that need to import a lot of things or where the transportation is not very cheap 
they also may have a very high energy demand. <clears throat> Another thing is um, the efficiency um, of the industry of industry and households. So actually households are, are mostly not very good uh, insulated and therefore they lose a lot of energy when they heat. And so let's here just point out insulation of houses that may also demand more energy. So let's summarize this thing and talk about the fairness. But first I would like to show you something, uh, a rather nice picture uh, I found in a, a, a good book. I actually forgot the name. <laughs> uh, Mac, uh, David McKay, yes, it was. And here we have a, a nice picture of the population of, uh, of the countries over the uh, greenhouse emissions. So it's, it's kind of a representation of the energy consumption. And we can say that, for example, countries like Kuwait or Qatar, they are very high peaks here. So they have a very high uh, greenhouse gas emission or very high energy consumption per capita. And but they don't have very many people. So therefore the whole area, which um, corresponds to the uh, energy consumption of the country uh, is therefore uh, not that big as for example, the energy consumption of the United States, where we can see there's a very high um, emission of greenhouse gases per capita. So we can say that uh, the big countries like China or United States, <clears throat> they have a very high uh, energy demand. But as we can see, uh, because China has so many people, I don't know why this thing here on the bottom doesn't manage. Um, there are many people, but the emission per capita is not very large. So therefore, uh, for the United States, it's much more critical here to uh, stop wasting so much energy. Okay, so let's move on um, to talk about the fairness. So is it actually fair to compare countries solely by this quantity? And the answer is obviously no. I don't think it's really a fair thing to do. And that's because um, so let's answer this question first. No, <laughs> um, because we we need to consider uh, we need to consider exports and imports. For example, a country who is highly uh, mm -hmm. who does many imports. Um, may have not such a high energy demand because the energy to produce all these goods is wasted uh, elsewhere and therefore they ha don't have a high energy demand and imports. So we need to consider exports and imports. And uh, I think just because the country is very cold or so, we can't say... Um, that they are wasting a lot of energy because they need this energy to uh, heat their houses more than other countries. So geographical issues. Um, let's say are un unavoidable. Of course, you can uh, spend more money into new technologies for insulation. Um, but in general, there's just some, the fairness is not uh, there for the geographical issues. 
So essentially, it's not just a, as easy to say we look at the energy demand per capita and then we can say which country wastes a lot of energy. So let's move on to the um, third task. This was renewable energies without the sun. So third, renewable energies without the sun. So actually, we want to discuss um, what kind of energy forms really depend on the sunlight. Renewable energy, I should write, without sun. So let's read again what the question was. We should discuss the role of sunlight for renewable energies. And actually, um, the sun is the primary energy source for mostly all kinds of energy forms we um, consider. And so let's write it down, the sun is the biggest source of energy biggest source of energy and it is the origin of almost as i say almost all renewables or renewable or essentially all energy forms. So even the non-renewable energies are based on the sunlight or the energy of the sun. Energy forms. Yes. So for example, in, in Germany, let's show you something else. Um, it's, uh, I want to apologize, it's in German, but I can explain again. <laughs> Uh, here we have the share of the renewables in the uh, in Germany. So there it's actually it's not as big as I hope it would be. But uh, as we can see here, um, these are all the shares that uh, of the renewables. And we see that photovoltaics, uh, which is directly uh, caused by or uses the sunlight to produce energy, uh, has a share of 6% on the whole uh, cake and wind power actually 16% and biomass 7% but also other energy forms like uh, brown coal or uh, black coal they contribute m very much there are some um, other things that don't depend on the sun like nuclear energy but we'll discuss that in a minute so um, so let's talk about the um, energy forms that are directly influenced by the sun. So directly um, there's photovoltaics, which uses the energy of the photons to um, bring electrons from the valence band into the conduction band and it uh, produces electricity just by absorbing photons. And then we have solar, solar heat or thermal heat. So what we do here is we just take a bunch of mirrors and fo uh, focus them into one spot and there we can heat some kind of liquid there and for example use a Carnot engine to produce work for example and uh, subsequently electricity. Um, other things is photosynthesis which uses the um, sun in a certain way photosynthesis and some examples are for example uh, are biomass 
So this is some sort of renewable energy. And I just want to say it, um, but it is not actually a renewable energy, but the fossil fuels also are store the energy because of the photosynthesis of the plants uh, thousands of years ago. Fossil fuels. So, okay. And other things that are caused by the sun are temperature gradients. So temperature gradients are the cause of airflow. And you may already guessed it. Um, the form of energy I talk about here is actually wind. So we need this gradient of temperature in our atmosphere for a wind or for the air to flow. And, and therefore, this is also the energy of the sunlight that we can use here for our, in our windmill. And the third thing is evaporation of um, water. And there are two distinct examples I want to give. Um, hydroelectric power is mainly caused by rainwater, which can flow through turbines and produce electricity. Hydroelectric power. And uh, another thing is osmosis power. So we use the um, pressure of two liquids with a high concentration of salt and a low concentration of salt. And this pressure can actually be used to produce energy. And there was a power plant in Norway which utilized this effect, uh, the osmosis pressure, uh, to produce energy. But unfortunately, it was a bit inefficient. And therefore, I think there is no actual research anymore on this topic. But uh, in principle, this is possible. So, however, there is also some forms of energy that are not uh, caused by the sunlight at all. And I want to point them out too. So, however, um, few renewables or a few sources uh, without sunlight. And they are, for example, geothermal. And uh, so geothermal uh, power plants like they use in Iceland, I think. And other things are radioactive material or radioactivity. And for example, in nuclear power plants. It's not uh, considered as a renewable energy because uranium is also um, and not endless, uh, but there's also some other things like in the fusion power plants, for example, that may come up in the future where we use the energy of the matter itself. So the um, energy that is equal to mc squared uh, to actually convert some of this mass into raw energy. So therefore it is not uh, connected to the sun at all. Other things are uh, tidal power plants, tidal power plants, which use the gravitational or rotational energy. Gravitational <laughs> energy. So, and I think that was all I wanted to say about the third task. So let's move on to the fourth. Um, here I want to talk about the heating values and want to explain the difference between the higher heating value and the lower heating value. <clears throat> and actually these are called, in, in German they are called Heizwert and Brennwert. And 
So let's first uh, give a little definition what they are. So for heating values, and we have to underline this as well, of course. Okay, and um, first the higher heating value. higher heating value and this is a measurement for the whole energy of a certain substance uh, this energy is actually reduced during the combustion of the substance and then the final cool down of the steam and the condensation of all the evaporated water in there and all of this energy put together, this is the uh, higher heating value. So it's actually a measure um, for the chemical, chemically, chemically, for the chemically, chemically bound energy in a substance so the whole chemical energy this means this energy means um, this is released during the combustion during combustion and final cooling cooling which leads to condensation and this condensation this condensation this um, is actually the latent heat of the steam which we include into the higher heating value and then we have the lower heating value which is essentially the higher heating value without the latent heat so if we just burn some of the coal and all of the steam evaporates and uh, goes out of the chimney then we lose all of the latent heat and just use um, the lower leading help value to describe our simple oven. And yes, so let's write that down. It's the higher heating value, or maybe I should write it in capital letters, higher heating value without the latent heat. So, and this is actually the, the value that is relevant for our simple oven we got here in the task for the combustion. So, relevant for a combustion. In a oven right okay then or in an oven i don't know <laughs> and so uh, the other task was to say how we can incre actually increase the efficiency of the simple oven and yes what we can do is we need to get to this latent heat here. So this latent heat here, this condensated uh, stuff, we want to get the energy from it.
And what, what we can do there is we um, can make a very long pipe, for example, and when the, when the heat runs through this pipe, it actually cools down and condensates at the wall. And then we can use this, uh, this heat, this heated walls of the pipes to heat other stuff or so actually we don't lose this kind of energy. So what we essentially do, we um, cool this cooling, uh, we perform the uh, cooling of the exhaust gases. And then the steam actually steam condensates um, on the wall and returns the energy to the wall which can be um, connected to an energy conductor and uh, used to heat our room for example. So then we can actually use this latent heat and increase the efficiency of our oven. So, and I would say we move on now to the last exercise or the last task. And here uh, we were to talk about the costs of electricity. And Let's first, let's first write this down. So the costs of electricity. We also have to underline this. Right. Okay, so let's talk about this. We are making a scenario where we run a company and we need to buy the coal reservoir for the next 10 years or so so that we can uh, run our power plant and we are not very uh, familiar with the concept of climate change so therefore we use a coal power plant um, which actually runs at a low efficiency of 40 percent and we are burning our coal um, which contains a 30 megajoule or MJ per kilogram. And we want to uh, calculate how much energy our power plant produces in, an, in 10 years if it runs uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And, but first, we should explain what the levelized cost of energy actually is. So let's discuss that first. The LCOE, LCOE is the levelized cost of energy. Let's write it down again. Levelized cost of energy. And we can actually calculate it in the following way. It is the sum of the costs over the lifetime of our power plant divided by the um, price of the electrical energy produced over the whole lifetime. The price of electrical energy um, produced over the lifetime. Produced.
So it's another to formulate it in other words, we can also say that it's an average minimum price um, that we have to uh, sell our electricity in order to avoid any losses. So it's actually the price we need um, to pay our um, or to sell our electricity that we don't make any losses actually. So now we can move on and actually calculate something the first time here now in this seminar. And so at first we want to know how much electrical energy we can produce. So let's mark that here. And the energy, so the total energy is the power of our power plant times the operation time. So and actually it was given here that our power plant runs at 200 megawatts and it runs 24 hours a day, 365 uh, days a year and for 10 years. So actually we just multiply all these things together and then we get a very huge number of 17,520,000 megawatt hours. And now because our coal here is given, so the lower heating value of our coal is given in MJ per kilogram, we need to convert this into MJs. So one watt hour is actually 3,600 watt seconds. <clears throat> so we can convert this 3,600 times um, this big number here. And this is actually, if we do the calculation, 6.3072 times 10 to the power of 10 mj and now we got the total energy we can produce in this 10-year operation and the second question was how much coal coal do we actually need here and this can we calculate so the mass of the coal it is just the total energy so the total energy we use over the lower heating value of our coal so the lower heating value this is just this thing given here, the 30 mj per kilogram. So the chemical energy we can get out of this coal, but without the latent heat. So it's the lower heating value. And this is actually um, decreased by the efficiency we call eta. And there we have our formula. So we can plug all of this in. So we have our 6.3072 times 10 to the 10 mj over this 40% is 0.4 times 30 mj per kilogram. And we can see the unit we get in, as a result is actually kilogram and it calculates to 5.3. Five, nee, sorry, it's five point two five six times ten to the nine kilogram. So more than five million tons of coal we need to actually run this. So it's a very large number, and uh, 
another question is how much uh, do we actually have to pay for all of this coal? And we were smart and we saw that on October the 1st, 2019, the coal price was very low and we can actually uh, retrieve this coal price by using this um, website here. I am sorry, I don't have an internet connection because of this streaming setup here. Uh, I can't, cannot show you this, but the, in the graph there, you can uh, look for the 1st October uh, 2019. And there we can find that the cost of coal is actually um, 43.55 uh, dollars per ton of coal. So actually the, the cost um, of the coal is we multiply it by the amount of coal we have here. So 5.256 times 10 to the 6 tons. And this actually gives us 228 million dollars. So, very huge number. And yes, that was the next question. Um, how much did we pay? Over 200 million dollars. How much CO2 did we produce? Another important factor. So let's uh, talk about how we can actually calculate the amount of CO2. There are several different ways. On the internet, you can find uh, some conversions. For example, one kilowatt hour uh, produces a certain amount of CO2. I actually looked that up and it was about um, one, uh, one kilogram of CO2 actually. So one kilowatt hour of energy is equivalent to an emission of one kilogram of CO2. <coughs> But we can make our life a little bit easier and use some math. Um, actually, we can calculate the ratio of the mass of CO2 and the mass of coal. And actually, what we can use here, the mass of CO2 is... Uh, CO2 is just um, some carbon and two oxygen. And then we can use what we know uh, from the atomic masses of those two things. So C12, uh, you should know, it's 12U and O has actually 16. So therefore, this is 32. And if we add them up together, we get <coughs> 44. So actually, the ratio of uh, CO2 and C is... 44 over 12. And now we can use this ratio to calculate the mass of the CO2 pretty easily. But you could also use other methods, as I already explained. And the CO2 then is 44 over 12 times the mass of the coal that we actually calculated here. Uh, 5.256 times 10 to the 9 kilogram. And we get as a result a mass of CO2, which is about 1.9 times 10 to the 10 kilogram. And I should also write 10 to the 10. So, actually quite a lot of um, CO2 emissions. So, actually there were some questions about the uh, comparison of those prices and so on with an offshore wind power plant. So, there was actually a paper of Blanco. You can read it and download it on the internet. 
just googling the title of this paper you will find um, this here and here in the following table i hope you can see it um, there we see that in 2020 it was estimated that the offshore wind uh, mill does actually uh, cost about 1274 euros per kilowatt and we can use this number to compare this with a power uh, with an offshore pl power plant so see the blanco paper there was given an estimate for the cost of an offshore windmill offshore windmill and as i said it was estimated as 1274 euros per kilowatt so uh, now we can use uh, our power of the power plant to actually calculate the costs of a hypothetical offshore windmill with a power of 200 megawatts which is a little bit unrealistic normal power plants uh, have powers of about 20 megawatts or so so actually this is a not really realistic but this is a general value which is not dependent on that we use only one windmill or 10 or so so actually this is a viable calculation so p is 200 megawatts and therefore we can uh, calculate our costs just by um, multiplying by this 200 uh, megawatts we can get our costs to 254.8 million euro okay actually it's in the same region as the costs we got for the nuclear power plant and in the last step we were to compare these two things and we say that dollars equals euros so we assume a parity of those two currencies and then we should calculate how much a ton of co2 should cost for identical costs of coal fuel so what we get, what we do here actually is we calculate the cost additional cost of co2 so that both uh, power plants are actually have the same price and so we just take the cost um, of our windmill and subtract the cost of our coal and divide this by the mass of our CO2 and then we get an <clears throat> amount of money for a certain amount of uh, coal so for per ton of coal so actually let's uh, substitute all these values here so 254.8 million dollars or euros better to say and here 228.9 million dollars they actually quite forget how to write the dollar sign it's quite embarrassing and divide this by the amount of coal which was 1.927 times 10 to the 10 kilogram and i actually have to excuse myself i need to drink something <clears throat> So, <clears throat> what does this actually mean? So we get here as a result, if we just say that this is equal to zeros, we assume the parity of those currencies, 
and therefore we can say that both are the same and then we get one point three three euros per ton so actually if we only consider the costs of the coal of the power plant then we only have to increase the price of our co2 or of our uh, yes co2 by 1.33 euros per ton which is actually not much we are currently other countries are discussing prices of about 100 euros per ton and actually then uh, our power plant would be more cost efficient than our coal burning power plant but it's actually it's already more efficient than our coal power plant and i want to give some reasons for that because we should all we should also discuss the neglected costs here in the last section so the neglected costs neglected costs are actually um, the initial invest of our power plant we also need an initial invest for our windmill but it's actually or probably much lower also the operation of the power plant so we need to actually run the power plant we need some workers and the staff members they also have to be paid then the maintenance which is probably more complicated than uh, the maintenance of a windmill then the decommissioning of our power plant after the 10 years or uh, when it is not very uh, efficient anymore and also we do not neglect uh, we also neglect the costs of the negative impacts of the co2 and they are actually quite massive but we cannot really um, calculate them precisely so the neg negative impacts of co2 uh, on the environment and therefore i want to say something about the levelized costs again which i actually forgot to do here so we defined it as the sum of the costs of over the lifetime of our power plant divided by the price of the electrical energy and um, here we can see all these costs are normally um, uh, used in this calculation here so the LCOE can, can actually write um, as the sum of all of the um, invest plus the um, operation and the maintenance The decommissioning, the com I actually want to abbreviate this now, and the actual cost of the coal, which was the only thing, only the coal was considered here. But I have to admit it's probably the biggest share of the, of the cake, uh, divided by the cost of the electricity. So actually all of these things are considered inside the uh, lcoe but they are neglected in our calculation and therefore the offshore power plant is probably more efficient with uh, this price of 1274 euros per kilowatt than the coal burning power plant and actually it's much more environmentally friendly so I think that was all I wanted to talk about today. I hope you liked the seminar. Um, if there are any questions, uh, we can have another Zoom meeting or you can write me an email. You can find my email on the uh, exercise sheet here on the bottom. And 
I hope uh, you liked my presentation here. And if there are any things you want uh, me to improve, then you can tell me. I would gladly hear from you. And then we see you on the next seminar.